Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about an increasingly popular form of LDO topology known as fully on-chip LDOs. They are also known as capless LDOs. Capless because they do not use any external or off-chip capacitors. Before jumping to the circuit, let's recall the motivation behind these architectures. Cost is obviously one advantage. Since it is fully on-chip topology, by definition we don't require an off-chip capacitor. Also, with fully on-chip topologies, we can put a large number of LDOs within the chip. This is because off-chip capacitors require a dedicated pin in the chip. And obviously, pin count of a chip is limited. And since we no more have a pin coming out to the external world, we don't require a short circuit protection. Another advantage of not having a large off-chip capacitor is we don't have to charge it. So we can get away with simpler startup circuit. Obviously, we can't have all these things for free. Fully on-chip LDOs often have poor load and line transient responses. And they often require more complex circuit design. Let's discuss these flip sides in some more details. Primary reason for poor transient is that we no more have a large capacitor sitting at the output. If there is a sudden demand of current, loop takes some time to respond. And if you have a large capacitor at the output, that capacitor will provide the charge in the meantime. We can always put some capacitor on chip, but it is almost never enough. To bring the point home, let's make a simple calculation. Let's say we want our on-chip capacitor to support 50 mA current for 10 nanosecond while maintaining the output voltage within 50 mV. In order to be able to do that, you'll require 10 nanofarad capacitor. I have used C dV by dt equation here. Now this is huge amount of cap to be implemented fully on-chip. But let's pretend for the moment that we want to do that. How much area will that require? A typical capacitance density in nanometer technologies is 10 femtofarad per micrometer square. But let's assume 20. So it will require 500,000 square micrometer or half millimeter square. Doable, but I doubt people will be happy if you ask that much area for LDO cap. And also consider that probably you will require more capacitor because these values are very modest values. So by increasing design complexity, basically we are making up for the lack of this large capacitor at the output. You start with very carefully defining your transient requirements. Frequency compensation schemes become more complex. Then feedback loops are added to sense the sudden transients. Other schemes like dynamic biasings are also required. Now let's go into these points in more details. When we have the luxury of off-chip capacitor, we put it through very extreme transient demands. For example, switching between zero to max current with nanosecond time. But such excesses are not recommended for fully on-chip designs. Ideally, you should have the actual load profile that you are designing for. You should take some margins over it, but start from there. If you don't have the actual load profile, then highlight in your specs what your LDO can do. For example, you can specify what kind of transient your LDO can take while maintaining the specified droop value. You should also specify some trade-offs. For example, you can specify what happens if you jump from a non-zero minimum current. This often helps. Or what happens if, for example, your crescent current budget is doubled. In short, you need to spend more time in defining your performance targets. Let's now look at frequency compensation. The big off-chip cap defines the dominant pole in conventional topologies. From transient performance perspective, output pole is the ideal location for dominant pole. But for a fully on-chip LDOs, it's very difficult to put the dominant pole at the output. To understand why, let's compare the relative magnitudes of two poles. Poles are defined by the product of node resistance and capacitances. Let's assume we have about 100 picofarad capacitance at the output, which is a typical value. And the uh, gate capacitance is of the order of 1 picofarad. We can use currents as a proxy of resistances. 
because we know that in MOS transistors, output resistance is inversely proportional to the current. Let's assume that the max output current is 100 mA and amplifier output current is 100 microampere. The pole frequency will be proportional to the ratio I over C. So now we can calculate the relative magnitude of two poles. So with these numbers we see that the output pole in fact will be higher than the gate pole. Here P stands for the proxy because we are not really calculating the frequency but a proxy of the frequency. And this is okay to do because we are comparing the relative magnitudes of the two frequencies. Now just to be sure if we replace this 100 picofarad number by a large number say 10 microfarad as will be the case with conventional topologies then this one giga number reduces to a much smaller number. So this calculation shows that the on-chip capacitor is not sufficient to make the output pole dominant. Okay, so we make the gate pole dominant. But notice that the gate pole is also not at a particularly low frequency. In fact, both poles are of the same order of magnitude. And this is the perfect situation to use the capacitance multiplication techniques such as Miller multiplication. And if you are lucky, this is all that you need to do. So let's analyze this circuit some more. You will almost always find a nulling register with this kind of LDO topologies. Nulling register has several advantages. It converts the right hand side zero of simple Miller compensation to a left hand side zero. And then this left hand side zero can be used to cancel the output pole. In order to maximize the Miller multiplication, you also try to increase the output impedance of the amplifier. And that means reducing current in the output branch or even using cascoded output stage. Make no mistake, these things have their own disadvantages. But in some application, it's fine. But what are those applications? So for example, if you are driving small analog circuits, you don't need to do much more than just this. Small analog circuits have many good things going for them. For one, there are no sudden demands in current and current is relatively well defined. But the circuit will struggle if there are sudden large changes in the output current. In such conditions, LDO needs to respond fast and reducing output current is not going to help in that. To better understand that, let's discuss the pole movements with the output load current. At minimum or low load currents, the output impedance is high and hence the output pole is at low frequencies. Now since output pole is your non-dominant pole, this is the worst case for your stability. Note that this is exact opposite of what we had in conventional LDOs. In conventional LDOs, low frequency is the best case for stability. So at low load currents, it's advantageous to have small current at amplifier's output stage. But as load current increases, the output pole moves rapidly at higher frequencies. So how can you use this information to improve your design? The first thing is find out what is your minimum load current and design for that. Say your minimum load current is 1 mA, don't kill yourself to stabilize your circuit for zero load current. Second, it's even better if you know beforehand when your big load transient is going to come. For example, if you are driving a big digital circuit, usually the information that when digital is waking up is available and use that information to prepare your LDO. For example, you can start drawing a large bleeding current from the LDO. The bleeding current will move the output pole to the higher frequencies which will make the LDO more stable. You can now even increase current in your amplifier which will make it faster. More generally, this is known as adaptive current passing and it's a strong tool in your arsenal. Adaptive current passing can be used even if you don't know the timing of your load current transients. You already have that information because current flowing into your power PMOS is your load current, more or less. You can easily sense this load current using a sense transistor. This sense transistor is typically much smaller than your main power transistor. We can feed this sense current back to the amplifier bias. Okay, so our output pole moves because the load current changes and the input pole moves because of the adaptive current biasing. But the zero frequency stays the same 
because it depends on the R and C and neither of them are changing. Even without adaptive feedback, a non-changing zero frequency is a problem. Let's look at a typical Bode plot to understand why. Here I'm showing a plausible Bode plot of a LDO at minimum load current. So we have our dominant pole over here. This is our output pole and this is the zero created by the nulling resistor and Miller capacitor. At higher load currents, the output pole will move outwards. So let's redraw the body plot for new output pole. The zero now will cause the gain roll off to stop and gain will plateau. The gain roll off will resume again when it hits the output pole. Now as such phase margin is still good. So why is it a problem? The problem is that at higher frequency, now there are other non-dominant poles will start to come into picture. And the risk is that we will not only see the output pole, but several other poles as well in close proximity. For this reason, the gain plateauing in Bode plot is normally not a desirable characteristic. One popular solution to this problem is so-called load tracking zero, which is also known as pole tracking zero. The idea here is to make the nulling register value dependent on the load current. The first step to do that is to replace the register by a MOS register. And the gate bias of that MOS register is dependent on the load current. We already have the load current information in this sense current. So we can use this sense current to generate the bias for this MOS register. Now there can be many creative ways to generate this bias. And I leave it to you to figure it out for yourself. One final recommendation before we leave the topic of frequency compensation. Value of Miller capacitor and nulling resistor is very much dependent on your output capacitor. But in many design conditions, the value of output capacitor is not accurately known. And for this reason, it's good idea to have some trimming options for Miller capacitor and nulling resistor. Let's now briefly discuss some ideas for the fast transient response. The fundamental idea behind most of the fast transient response scheme is to detect a sudden change in the output voltage and then use this information to make appropriate change at the gate of the power transistor. For example, if there is a sudden dip in the output voltage, then you would like to pull the gate of PMOS transistor low. But if the output voltage goes high, you would like the power PMOS gate to also go high to shut it off. Now, in some sense, this Miller compensation inherently provides this kind of reaction. But in many cases, this may not be sufficient. For example, if there is a large overshoot at the output, then you might need to apply an additional bleeder current to pull the output voltage down. This kind of techniques require additional feedback loops on the top of the existing feedback. For example, several design propose dual loop system the conventional slow loop to regulate the output voltage and a fast loop to respond to the transients. These kinds of approaches definitely improve the performance, but at the additional cost of design complexity. I will discuss some of these designs in future videos. In next video, I will discuss some miscellaneous topics related to the LDO design. So post your comments below and thanks for watching.